Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Psalm 90 is the psalm with the most to say about time. That's appropriate because this is the last Lord's Day before the end of the year. There's a few days to go, but still it is the last Lord's Day of 2011. Psalm 90 says a lot about time. It talks about years. Verse 4 refers to a thousand years. Verse 10 talks about 70 or 80 years. As well as years, we read here of days. We read in verse 4 about the night, the 12 hours of darkness. We read about morning and evening in verse 6. Dividing the 12 hours of light into two, then you would have six hour period. Then we even have the watches of the night mentioned in verse 4. Maybe three or four hours. Measurements of time. We have prepositions of time, such as before. Verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, forever God formed the world, he is the great God. We read also of adverbs of time, and an adverb is a word that modifies a verb. An adjective modifies a noun. Adverbs of time. Verse 10. We are soon cut off. And then there's this question, question repeated in various forms in the book of Psalms. Return, O Lord, how long? Verse 13. In speaking so often of time, Psalm 90 refers to God and time. Before the mountains were brought forth, thou art God. In verse 4 we're told that to God a thousand years are as a day. In fact, a thousand years are like a watch in the night with God. Time means something different with regard to the being of God than it does for us who are creatures of time because God is above time. God isn't in time. God created time for us to move about and to live in because time is what befits creatures rather than the great God who is timeless and exalted above all change. Man, we're told, could be described, according to the Bible, and Moses is the one who wrote of this, as living almost to a thousand years. That was the way it was before the flood. Methuselah 969. That's how long he lived. In verse 10, an elderly man lives to be the age of 70, and if he's doing well, he might get to 80, but then he's going to have a certain amount of sorrow and even more pain. And then he'd be cut off and he flies away. And in the earlier stages of modern man, very few made it to 70 or 80. Not many even made it to 50. And some of them, quite a large percentage of them, didn't survive childhood. Man is a creature within time. He can never escape it, even in heaven, because it's part of being created. Now this 90th psalm is, so far as we know, the only psalm of God in the 150 written by Moses. Though I suppose it's possible that some of the psalms without a heading were written by Moses. Hypothetically, I don't believe that is the case. And so Moses wrote this psalm because Moses was no mean poet. Moses had a lot of virtues. He didn't grow old in the same way as others do in terms of loss of energy and power. He was as fit as a fiddle at 120 because God gave that man energy to withstand a recalcitrant and ungodly people. 
But amongst Moses' many virtues was his poetical ability. He writes a beautiful song of victory after Israel crossed the Red Sea. The Lord is a man of war, beautiful in holiness, and he has cast Pharaoh and his host into the sea like a stone. And one of the last things Moses did was to pen the song of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 32 to fix heavenly doctrine in the hearts of his people. So Moses, as a great poet and as the one who understood most about time is particularly suited in the province of God, and this is organic inspiration to write, the 90th Psalm. Moses wrote about the creation of time and the very first week. Moses was Israel's greatest historian. He wrote about the first two and a half millennia, the first two and a half thousand years of the history of the world. And Moses is the only written source we have of life before the flood. This Moses was a man interested in chronology <coughs> as a historian. He was interested in genealogies. Genesis chapter 5, for instance. So and so begat so and so when he was sitting such an age. He was the father and the grandfather and the great grandfather. Because Moses was the one God used to trace the two great lines, the lines of election, Adam through Seth and all the way to Noah, and then through to Abraham, as some of the children will be learning in catechism class, and also the line of reprobation, Cain and his ungodly son Enoch after him he named the city and then Lamech the first bigamist and so forth. In Moses' own life he saw a great deal. Forty years in the palace of Egypt brought up as a son of Pharaoh and learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians as your minister preached from Hebrews chapter 11 a while back and that country, Egypt, was the center of civilization. There was Moses in Pharaoh's palace as the son of the king, right at the heart of ungodly civilization, working hard as a good student. Then the next 40 years, a big change in his life, a shepherd out in the wild with a lot of time for contemplation. Quiet years, the middle 40. And then the next 40 were years of grief and heartache and misery for the poor man, leading that people whose heart was set on mischief, for they did not know God's ways. He saw the plagues, including the seventh. He saw the opening up of the Red Sea, manna, angel's food, so tasty was it. Though the angels, of course, don't eat, but you understand it's superlative. All of Israel at Mount Sinai with the giving <coughs> of the law, and then the murmuring and complaining through the desert. And so this evening we want to listen to the timeless God who speaks to us through his servant Moses, and as he teaches us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Numbering our days then. First the numbering, second the purpose, and third the prayer. Now this whole subject of numbering, if you have to place it in a school curriculum, you'd say mathematics. Mathematics. Moses, unlike some of the ancient civilizations, Moses knew the decimal system. He counted in tens. Not all that. Moses even knew fractions. Think of the Ark of the Covenant. Two and a half cubits by one and a half cubits by one and a half cubits. 
Moses recorded the history of, J of Joseph when Joseph told the Egyptians that they must give a fifth of their land for grain. A fifth. That's Genesis 47 verse 24. Moses talks about a tenth. He defines an omer as a tenth of an ephah. And Nehemiah 5 verse 11, which of course Moses didn't write, but it refers to one hundredth. That's a pretty small fraction. And if you read the books of Moses, you can see not just fractions, but multiplication and division and subtraction <coughs> and addition the basic building blocks of numbering and calculations and if you think of the Levitical year 50th that's 7 times 7 and 1 time structured by numbers now the addition is the subject we're concerned with in our text teach us to number our days number our days count them count them how many are our days now there's lots of things that we count you count your own age you count if you've enough money when you're waiting in a shop to buy whatever it is that you're to purchase you do a lot of counting too when you get your exam papers back to try and scrape another mark or two that the teacher may just not have added up so that you can get a little bit higher in the ranking. But we're counting days here. I did a little bit of counting of days too. If someone is in primary one, first year of primary school, they've lived about 1,500 days. If you are 30, that's about 11,000 days. And if you are three score years and 10, you've lived over 25,000 days. It's a lot of times you've gotten up out of bed in the morning. Now when we number our days, we number the days that are past, which isn't to say though that you should have calculated how many days you've lived. I gave you some examples. That isn't exactly the idea because it's not so much the quantity of our days as we're interested in, the quality of our days. What have we done with our days? You could say we're told here to count our days in a sense, but the main thing is to think if our days have counted it's not really how long we have lived, but how we have lived. That's the idea here. And you see here in this passage, Moses numbered Israel's days and saw that Israel was afflicted for her sin. And so he prayed for days of God's conscious favor. Verse 15, make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. So when we number our days then, this means that we have a long range perspective of our past. I have lived, how many years, how many days that would take, and what have I done with them? That's the idea. What have I done with them? Peter says in 1 Peter that the days past of our life will suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. We spent enough time and not enough years wasting our lives as ungodly and now that we're converted we must use our days for the service of Jesus Christ. We must redeem the time for the sake of him who redeemed us. Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, with reference to the care of widows in the church, says that these sorts of widows should be enrolled in the number of those for whom church provision is given. That is, elderly women who have brought up children, who have lodged strangers, who have washed the saints' feet, who have relieved the afflicted, 
and diligently followed every good work. First Timothy 5 verse 10. They, these women, numbered their days and applied their hearts onto wisdom so that they filled their days with good works and those are the sorts of women that the church needs to provide for in their need. Assuming that their family isn't able to help them or not sufficiently able to help them. Hezekiah, when he was told that he was to die, prayed this to the Lord, I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. Isaiah 38 verse 3. He numbered his days. So there isn't any reference to counting them all up. But he could look back and say, the days that I've lived, this is how I have behaved myself. Though he wasn't for one minute denying that he'd sinned. He knew all right that he'd sinned. And we even know from the account of scripture of some of his sins too. Though he was a godly, fine king. So when we number our days then, we think long term, and we also take a short range perspective of our past. What about today? Did we manifest the love of Christ to our wives? Did we submit to our husbands the way that the church is to submit to Christ? Did we live as obedient sons and daughters? These are the questions. Do we show respect for those whom God has set over us? And how do we use our tongue, that little member that boasts so many great things? Then too, we should think about the past few weeks or months when we fall into various patterns of sin, when we stop doing things that we should be doing, when we indulge the flesh in a specific area, we think to perhaps even of this current year and say to ourselves, you know, I wouldn't care to say it for everybody here, but for me, this past year hasn't seen a lot of growth. I haven't been particularly faithful. And if we have made progress, even in our own estimation, it can be hard to evaluate such a thing. Then we must resolve to make greater progress in the service of Jesus Christ. Yeah. We look back, we look back longer term. And we also think about the days to come. Now, of course, there are differences regarding the days to come. The most obvious one being, well, they haven't happened yet. But still, differences. We know when the days to come start now, but we don't know when they're going to end because we don't know when we're going to die or when the Lord will return. So we don't know the number of our day's future. Yeah, we don't know. This of course has two helpful effects since we don't know when we're going to end we should be more watchful and ready because one day we're all going to give and have to give an account of ourselves to God for we know it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment and then, since we don't know the quantity of the days to come, we should focus even more so on their quality. This is what Moses is about when he prays, verse 13. Return, O Lord, how long? Then he asks, Lord, satisfy us with thy mercy, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad, according to the days in which we've been afflicted, the years in which we've seen evil. We want days of mercy and joy and gladness days when the work of God appears to us and we may do it so that God establishes us in obeying him and working for his glory that's 16 and 17 so if I were to ask you what sort of days do you want for the rest of your life I can be pretty confident of the sort of thing you would say you would say especially since we're in church and hearing the word of God we want days of greater faithfulness and obedience. We want this too for our own hearts. We want days of better fellowship with the Lord and with one another. Days of greater love and thankfulness. Days in which we truly live as those who are alive from the dead. Those who live not unto themselves, but unto him who died for us 
and rose again. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. That's the purpose. We talk about numbering our days. <coughs> We're not trying to make ourselves out to be better than we are or to look back into the past and say, oh, what a good boy am I, and heap up our own righteousness. We look back upon our own life, and if we see any good there, and we do, we don't see as much as we like, but we do see good. We acknowledge it and confess that that was the grace of God to us, because of me, that is, of my flesh, cometh no good thing. And when we say, yes, that was evil and sinful, well, we know to whom we can attribute that. That was us, our own sinful flesh. We don't either number our days because we want to think about the future and grow all morbid. We don't want to think about death so that we cloak ourselves in doom and gloom and become very humble and very, very pious in an unhealthy, depressing sort of ways. Droning that we're all going to die and trying to make ourselves as miserable as sin. No, we remember, remind ourselves that our days are numbered so that we are more careful and thoughtful that it may be to us an additional incentive for godly living now so that we don't waste our time or days, but that we're more realistic and sober and filled with hope. hope. Because we believe that those who enjoy fellowship with God in this world, in the soul, after death, will continue to know God more richly, and that one day we in our bodies shall be raised, because Jesus Christ has brought life and the mortality of the light through the gospel. And the prince of life is raised from the dead. And scripture tells us to lay hold on eternal life. The other thing that we need to be mindful of here, this isn't our purpose in numbering our days. We don't want to think about our sins in order to paralyze ourselves with guilt. To become so troubled in an unhealthy sort of way that we're stunned and we mope about the past and just give up. It's true that everybody here, especially those, including those, but not only those who are troubled about the evil things that we've done that we regret and we're ashamed of or wish we'd never done, True, yeah, but everyone experiences that. That's part of what our own consciences tell us. And then when we think about these things in the light of God's word, David did too, he prayed that the Lord would forgive the sins of his youth. And he prayed for that years afterwards. Not that he doubted God's mercy, but he needed to hear in his conscience the word righteousness in Jesus Christ, that he might be delivered from the oppression of his guilt. And we confess these things. And then we confess not only our sins, but we confess, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Because we're not only to consider the past, but to experience forgiveness for our sins. And then we are to forget those things which are behind and to press forward towards the mark of the high price of God and Jesus Christ. We remember that God is gracious and ready to forgive, far more ready to forgive than we are to confess. We confess that Jesus Christ has borne our sins away and the way of confessing them to God, and believing in Jesus, we experience and receive and know that blessing of the gospel of Christ. Teach us to number our days, not that we become morbid, or paralyzed with fear or guilt. But teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Numbering our days makes us wiser, 
Now wisdom is seeing reality, living with reality. <coughs> and reality is, to put it in a few short, simple sentences, reality is that God has appointed our relatively short days. Teach us to number our years. No, it says teach us to number our days. Reality is, as everybody knows, even the children, but nobody ever really takes it to heart, Reality is that we're all going to die. Everybody else has. They've all died. What makes us think we're any different? This house, the people in the house next door, and what happened then? Well, you could say they moved on, but some of them are dead. Reality is, too, that we may also die very soon. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. For you don't know what a day will bring forth. That's James chapter 4 too. Go to now you who say, I'm fond of this, and if you got the other thing, for you don't know what a day may bring forth. And then reality is too, that we shall all be judged according to how we live our days. That's wisdom. Wisdom to understand reality, and more importantly, wisdom is adapting to reality. Wisdom is learning from our past events that we avoid the pitfalls that we fall, fell into, try not to fall into them again, and we see God's faithfulness in them. We learn to trust Him more. So we live in the knowledge that the real world, that is the eternal world, is the world which is to come. And then we live in the knowledge, we adapt ourselves to this too, that our God is a God who forgives sins. The God who forgives sins such that the believer, though conscious of his sins, can even look forward to the judgment day with peace and joy. Can contemplate it without fear, and without torment, or without even the suspicion that he's going to be punished. Because he isn't. Because Christ has forgiven our sins. And we will be rewarded. And since Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1 Proverbs 8, for instance, teach this. Then the wisdom is understanding all things in the light of Jesus Christ. That's wisdom. He is our wisdom, as well as our sanctification and our righteousness and our redemption. The wisdom could be said to be the perfect means to reach the highest goal. That's a further clarification of adaptation, adopting things. So we have the highest goal in mind and we use the perfect means. And the highest goal for God is his own glory. It's his own glory in Jesus Christ in saving his church. And the perfect means that God has appointed in his wisdom is the incarnation of the Son of God he would be born of the Virgin Mary and then 30 or so years later die on the cross for all the sins of his people. And then wisdom on our part is to reckon with that reality and live accordingly. We see this with Jesus Christ himself. He numbered his days and he applied his heart unto wisdom. He certainly did. He numbered his days. Well, think about this word from John 9. I must work the works of him that sent me. For the night cometh when no man can work. That's numbering your days. Though the word number isn't there, but that's what it means. And when his hour was come, that's the phrase particularly used in John's God, when his hour was come, he atoned for our sins on the cross, and then he numbered his days. In the resurrection, he numbered three of them. And then he rose from the dead so that he might fulfill prophecy. And then, being risen from the dead, seated at God's right hand, having poured forth the Holy Spirit, he initiated the New Testament era, which is called in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. And that now is, first of all, the whole New Testament era, 
And more specific, any time within that when God calls us to repentance, when we hear his word and turn to him in Jesus Christ. Christ lived this life of wisdom, adopting all things to reality, knowing the scriptures, so he lived according to them, and knowing the scriptures too, so he would consciously fulfill the prophecy. Wisdom is also seeing and adapting to the reality that our days differ in quality. Everybody experiences time. You go to bed and a few hours later you wake up and everybody experiences the same time as alive on earth. But the most important thing in time is the quality of it. And to speak in very broad terms, the days of the wicked are full of wrath. Whether God may make them very rich and give them a big turkey dinner today, their days are filled with wrath. And though they may try to deny it, their days are filled with wrath because, Romans 1 says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. And they know it too in their consciences. But we're particularly interested in the days of the righteous. And the days of the righteous, as we experience them, are mixed. Always we have God's favour, but not always do we experience God's favour, or at least not to the same extent. Our days are mixed. Some days good, and some bad, and then mixed in all sorts of varieties through them. Moses talks about time, the experience of time, in verse 15 for Israel. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. So there were some days, affliction, some years, evil. And then Moses prays for days and years of gladness. And it's particularly appropriate for Moses to pray that, and especially the period of Moses' life, which most suggest this to us. Think of the history of Israel. Israel, according to Numbers 13 and 14, when the twelve spies were sent out and ten of them were liars, they came back and said, oh, boy, they're everybody in that city. Oh, everybody, they're all giants. Everybody else, oh. you see the walls of the cities? They're all, they all mount up to heaven. Total nonsense. Total nonsense. There's some high walls, all right. But their hearts are filled with fear and unbelief and they exaggerated and lied. And only Joshua and Caleb had their spiritual wits about them and said, the people are bred. God is with us. We can win this battle. And the people, being wicked, believed the lies. And then God said, all right, now wander for the next 38 years. Wander around in circles. I'll have to kill you. So they wandered with that generation's carcasses falling in the wilderness. And the general tenor of those days is wrath. 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 Carcasses. Funerals. Burials. Weeping. What was the point? Why did they wander for 38 years? It wasn't as if they were even going anywhere. They could, they, it wasn't that they had some great distance traversed. No, they had to just keep wandering until all the people were dead. What a depressing miserable way. There were no mobile phones in those days, but if someone had phoned an Israelite and said, what are you doing these days? Oh, well, we're just wandering around. Well, how long are you going to be doing that? Well, Moses says 38 years. We well, couldn't even shorten to 30. No, no. He says a whole generation. You guys are just wandering in the wilderness until you're all dead. Yeah. Boy. Well, that is miserable. Wandering around and then some would die with this sin, and Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they'd come up with the rebellions, so and some would die that way, and then they'd just keep whittling it away until they died. And God's anger and wrath burned against Israel. Taking it as a nation now, because of their national sin, anger, and wrath. And of this, I believe, Moses writes in Psalm 90. This is Basically, what God did for the 40 years wilderness wandering. Verse 8, God set the sins of Israel before him, all of Israel's secret sins in the light of his countenance. 
According to verse 7, he consumed and troubled them in his anger and wrath. Think carcasses. And then verse 10, Moses says that our days are trouble, labor, and sorrow. Especially the case for old people when the pains get worse each year. But for Israel, labor and sorrow. And so Moses prays in the light of these rather depressing years, prays that Israel, which is God's only church now, so there were a few scattered believers as we know, but Israel, which centrally was the church, that there be no days of God's favor again. That's the prayer. Verse 14, O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. And this was Moses' wisdom in this situation to submit to God's providence. God has told us our generation will not see the promised land. We've got to wander for 38 years until this generation is dead. And our Lord, verse 17, establish the work of our hands. May the church use its days in thy service. And let us at least pray for God's blessing on the generation to come. Verse 16, Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yea, the work of our hands establish thy it. 38 years. Now for us today, our hearts, our days are often mixed we can recall days too many in which we didn't experience God's blessing in the way that we should have. And we all know how this goes. <coughs> we sin, which is bad enough, and then we refuse to confess it. Your minister preached some sermons in Psalm 32 recently. Uh, the passage teaches that when we refuse to confess our sins, God's hand is heavy upon us, our bones wax old all the day long and we know trouble and sorrow and then we confess our iniquities and then God restores us because we spent too long like a mule that refused to be corrected and then we look for joy and peace in something else that doesn't work our consciences accuse us and we feel God's anger upon us. And this can of course continue for a short period of time, part of a day, too long though, or for weeks, or for months, or for years. When we dry up spiritually, when we continue in our sin, we won't let go of it and we won't admit that we did wrong. I know people who've been walking seriously in sin for years, but they won't repent. They just keep on with it and dry up. Miserable. Even in the Bible, David, David wouldn't confess to God his sin with Bathsheba. <coughs> Nathan's polite, mannerly but devastating critique, telling him about the, about the lamb. And the old man who had this one lamb, and you know the story, thou art the man, that's what you've done. You could have been any woman you wanted. It would have been sinful for him to have it, he shouldn't have been doing it, but then you had to take the, man, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, a faithful, godly servant who fought in your army. And then David was brought to repentance. Now since the entry of sin into this world, the world is filled with suffering. We live in the 21st century when through the great powers that God has given to man. There are many great inventions and developments in the world to limit the sin, the suffering rather of this world, but you can't avoid it completely. So that we know sickness and pain and bereavement. You lose your job, you crash your car, your children live sinfully. You see people walk away from the faith. 
That's what happens. And then too, we must be wise, acknowledge our sins and the, that we commit in connection with these things that don't get better, but admit that God is good and do us good and acquiesce in His will. Christian, those days of joy and days of sadness. That's why Moses was so well equipped to lead Israel. Two million people, most of whom murmured and complained, had seen it all. But then we've also known days of joy. We know days of joy in the past. We know days of joy when we grow, when God speaks to us in the Bible, and it's the most exciting thing, and just wish that all the world could see. And how come we don't see it so clearly that Jesus is the Son of God, and He forgives our sins, and your spirit's lifted and happy. And then you have days when you get engaged, or when your son is born, or days when you get a bit of a break and go on vacation and feed rest of the game for the first time in months. And then you enjoy too the quiet peace of conscience, conscience void of offence. And you know the reward of hard work and faithfulness. And you see your children walking in the ways of the truth. The Christian prays especially for this joy, and that's probably why, from one perspective, the greeting of Jesus to the saint is, Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Good, faithful servant. We look to joy. We look for joy also in the future, because joy is a quality of God. God is always joyful. God is always at peace. And all we need for greater joy is to know God in Jesus Christ. The future is God's. He has decreed it. He will work it out for his good. And Jesus Christ is the one who is exalted as head over all. And he suffered a new days of grief. But for the joy that was sent before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. And the future therefore also, and the future of joy belongs to the church because, as we read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, all things are yours. Not only Paul and Apollos, that is, Christian ministers, but the past and the present and the future and the world to come. And all things are yours. And it means that since we own them, because God owns everything, we own them. And God who owns them will work all things for good. All things are yours and they serve our salvation. And all things are yours because all things are Christ's. And Christ will see to it that all things work for our good. And so when we confess with Isaiah chapter 9, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, the incarnation, unto us the church Christ is born, not unto the world, but unto us. Then unto us belongs even this new year. God will work it for good. God will work it for good. Because all things work together for good for those who love God. And the more we walk in obedience, the more it will work for good for us, and the more we will experience it as working for good for us. And we number our days, and we reckon in this, and we apply our hearts to wisdom. Finally, this verse is a prayer. It's a prayer, it's a request made of God. So teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts onto wisdom. And when we ask God to do this, we admit, of course, that we cannot do this of ourselves. This sort of wisdom is not innate in us. We're all fools. We're fools, and the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool in us always denies God and can't see him even when he's in front of our nose. Wisdom is a quality of the heart. This is a sort of divine mathematics where you don't just, you know, sleep 365 days in a year. Therefore, if I'm 27, then 63 or 92, therefore, that, that's not the idea. You take Belshazzar, 
Belshazzar was having a feast with his friends, to do the word for them, when he saw a disembodied hand writing on the wall, Meanie, Meanie, Tico, you farson. And Daniel was brought in because they were all scared out of their wits. Daniel interpreted it, Meanie, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Here you are. There's so many days you have left. But he still couldn't number his days. And he perished in his sin. And sometimes you see, and this is very tragic, elderly people who are near death, they don't even number their days either. They can't. can't do it. They're wicked and they can't do it. And they know they're very soon going to die and they've nothing to do. They've nothing to do, sadly, because there's nothing they can do. God takes our strength from us so that we've no, no power when we're really old. And even then they keep on loving sin. And their days are bored, filled with boredom, nothing to do. They think that nobody cares for them. They're alone, which is often sadly the case. But they still don't repent. And then you come and they don't even want to know. They don't even want to tell them what the Bible says. Because there's no, no wisdom in it. And they perish. And you say to them, that, you know, you could at least have some hope. Even from an earthly point of view, some hope, some meaning in your life, and you can read the scriptures and, and know the fellowship of God. They don't want to uh, just sit there, sit there, and the hardest thing they do all day is get out of bed, and they live their boring, meaningless existence and die and perish. So it takes grace, and that's why we pray for it to number our days. Grace to number our days because only the Holy Spirit can teach us to do it and apply to us the wisdom of Christ. This we're only able to do through prayer. This is Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God, and our text is a prayer, so teach us, a request made to God, teach us to number our days that we may apply our heart to wisdom. So teach us an urgent prayer in the light of what we've seen with God, time and the brevity of life and God's justice and goodness. And God even causes the calendar to flip over in a few days' time to make the church think a bit more about this. And then he makes us sick so that we have a bit more time to lie and can't do much. We lie on our bed and then we will think about it. And he even makes us old. So we can no longer do the things that we used to do without even thinking about it. And we say we're soon going to perish in this world. We're going to number our days, apply our hearts unto wisdom, turn to the Lord for strength. Amen. Yes. Our Father in heaven, full of grace and mercy and peace, grant us this wisdom that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom and that we may be servants to experience more of the joy and gladness of the Lord as we walk in faithfulness and seeking the coming of thy kingdom. Bless us, Father, as a body of thy people here. And use us. Establish the work of our hands. Yea, establish them. For Jesus' sake, amen.